I've been to the National Gallery of Art several times and look at the, the Rubens and the Van Goghs and the Rembrandts. It's, they have amazing stories behind those pictures, but pictures are static. They don't change. And as good as they are, uh, do you have some pictures hanging on the wall in your house? Uh, I, I get tired of the pictures and I have to change them. Pictures are good. I heard about in some, some of the tenants in New York and other cities, you have a window uh, in your apartment or your complex, and you open it up and look out, and you're, what you're looking at is a brick wall. It's just the next building over. A lot of those people take those windows and don't really open them because they're just looking at a brick wall, and they paint a picture on the window. Uh, so at least they have something to look at. But was it, wouldn't it be so much better to have a window that you could see something different all the time? The windows of your house are, are really important. Everybody has a window in their soul. Don't paint it. Pity the poor person who has a window of their soul and there's a picture painted on it. And it's a picture of themselves. And they see the world from their souls, how it relates to them only. We need the Holy Spirit to come and get this squeegee out and wash the window of our soul so we can see out that God's glorious creation. We like our windows in our houses. We like our art. But if you had to pick the two, I think I'd have more windows. There's a, there's a house in New England, I think it is. It's got um, 52 windows. 52 windows in the house. And it's got 365 panes of glass because it's got one window per week and one pane of glass for each of the, I mean, one pane of glass for each of the d days of the year. They, they have something that's uh, really amazing. People come and look at that because they always keep it shiny and squeaky and clean and it's, the, the house is, a, I think it's a Victorian. When you look out your window, you see changing light. Any given moment, in any given day, you see a different landscape if you take a moment and look. You see a different sunset. You see a different sunrise. You may see a thunderstorm. You may see a rainstorm. If you're in the right part of the country, you may see the glistening snow through the icicles on your window. But it was always something to see differently. Scripture is a window. It's not a picture. Because it's a changing landscape. Many people take their doctrine and they take the Bible stories as pictures. Oh, I've seen that one. We need to look at the Word of God as a window because any given day, any given moment, you can look in the window of the Word of God, the Scripture, and see something different. Something that you have not seen before. Something that's maybe amazing. So I wanted to encourage you today to Think about the scripture as a window into the nature of heaven and the character of God, just who you are and who I am. This is something that I've met people, and you know some of them too. They see, they've looked at all the pictures of the Bible, and the pictures of the Bible seem so old to them because they've seen them all, and they've read them all. This is really not a picture book. This is an open window into heaven. And the landscape changes. As you grow older, you see different things in the scripture. The different seasons of your life, you'll see something different. You'll see something amazing. And so today, I wanted to open the window of the scripture and look into that window at one of the most glorious scenes it's not a picture. It's not a picture album that shows you photographs one after the other. It's an open window through which the wind, the Holy Spirit can blow through and touch your life. But this one particular place is the, is the transfiguration. Most of the churches around the world, uh, Baptist churches and some of the more charismatic churches, they don't follow the liturgical calendar, calendar. We don't follow it religiously. But today is a day that most churches uh, around the world, in Europe and South America, are celebrating Transfiguration Sunday. Let's join them. 
Let's join them and just take a look at this. Let's look through the open window of the word of God and see what we can see differently. You say, Pastor, I've already read the story of the transfiguration. I know Jesus took the disciples, three of them up the mountain, and as he was praying, he was changed, he glowed. Uh, oh, next. There's more to this. There's an open window that we can look in here and see something brand new today. And I'm hoping that we can open this window and feel the breeze of the Holy Spirit blowing in. Not look at a brick wall, but to see not pictures, but something living and alive and linger near the transfiguration. Peter, looking back on this experience, and I'm gonna read all three of these places, it's in Matthew chapter 17, it's in Mark chapter nine, and it's in Luke chapter nine. There's just a few verses I'm gonna read to you. But Peter, looking back on this, put this in your back pocket, Peter said, when we, we did not follow cleverly invented stories or fables, as the King James says, when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dunamis, And perusa is the two words there. The personal appearing, the majestic power of Jesus. He says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter was traumatized. He was knocked back. He not only knocked back, he was knocked forward onto his face in in this instance. And he's remembering it years later We were eyewitnesses of this majestic moment, says Peter. For he, that is Jesus, received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. The voice of God that Peter heard reverberating through that cloud that was composed of light. It was not a misty cloud. It was a cloud of light that came over them and enveloped them as as they were on this mountain. He says, that voice that I heard come out of that bright cloud is still reverberating in my ears. This voice came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Throw the window open. Let's see something new in this story. And Peter says, I can never forget it. I will never forget the time when Jesus took us up the mountain. The Apostle Paul talking about us, you and I. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul had an encounter similar to uh, the transfiguration on the road to Damascus. He was also knocked to his knees and he heard the voice of Jesus and the light was so bright that shone around him that it blinded him for a number of days until he was prayed for and then healed. So the, the wonderful light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure. This is a treasure. This is not a picture. This is a treasure that we possess that is so valuable. What is a treasure? It's something valuable. We have this treasure of the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ in this jar of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So the Apostle Paul, remembering the bright experience that he had that was similar to what Peter, James, and John saw with Jesus on the mount when he took them there. John remembered, he says, and the word was made flesh, that's Jesus. The word, the idea, the thought that came out of the heart of God became flesh and dwelt among us. He pitched his tent in our neighborhood is another way of saying that. Jesus came and dwelt among us the word And John says, and we beheld his glory. And I believe he's remembering. Later as an old man, he's writing down his memoirs, which we call the Gospel of John. And he said, we saw his glory. We beheld his glory, the the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
through the open window of the transfiguration today, John is telling us through that window that there was a moment that he recognized the glory of God that was coming through uh, him from the Father and was full of grace and truth. And also later he said this, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which, we, which he have, we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which our hands have touched. John's hands touched the fabric of the robe of Jesus. He said, I can still feel it under my fingertips. I can still see what I saw with my eyes in Jesus. The Greek verb here is a perfect tense. And it's a construction of the Greek that is very powerful. And you can read it this way. That which was from the beginning which we have heard and we're still hearing it. That which we have seen with our eyes so much so that we're still seeing it. And that which we have looked upon and I still see it and I touched and can still feel it. This we are proclaiming to you. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you that eternal life which was with the Father has come to us. John, I believe in this particular passage of scripture is going back in the pages of his life to the time when they walked up that high mountain. You know, we don't know where that is. Uh, Some people say it was uh, Mount Hermon. Very high, very misty, very cold. Could have been Mount Tabor, not as high, maybe 4,000 feet, just a little closer. In all of the places around where Jesus was, there's several very high elevated places that could have been any one of them. John says, I remember the day when Jesus walked with us up that mountain and it was quiet. You can hear the gravel crunching under their feet and they're talking in hushed tones, because Jesus had invited them to an elevated place to pray. And they're on the way to pray. Do you have uh, inspirational moments when you're at an elevated place? I can remember being in Luray, Virginia, and looking out over the Luray Valley and seeing the fall colors of the tree, and my breath was taken away. And high elevated places many times do uh, elevate our sense of our own smallness and God's magnificence and our own inimportance and the importance of all of creation. And so it's good for us that Jesus knew this. He took them to this elevated place where they could see the valley below and they could see the houses and the river. They went there to pray and they were with the Son of God. And I have to tell you, I agree with most commentators when I read this story that when they finally arrived at the place that they were going to pray and they sat in silence for a moment, in solitude, that this was in the late evening, pretty near dark. And they had climbed that high hill and they were very, very tired. So tired, as a matter of fact, that Peter, James, and John fell asleep. They were there just dozing on the verge of a great important blessing. Peter, James, and John, they seem to to fall asleep at the wrong time all the time. I pretty well relate to that. (laughs) But John says, I can still see it. I can still hear it. I can still feel it. This light that appeared, I'm testifying to it. It was so magnificent and so powerful. Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to the mountain. And we say, why did they take, why didn't you take them all? Why did you take those three? Well, in the Old Testament it says, under the witness of three, let every matter be established. So Jesus wanted three witnesses to what was gonna happen and what they were gonna see. Two of them survived and wrote about it as we've seen. James, uh, we, don't, we didn't hear anything from him because he was killed. He was one of the first martyrs in the church, he was killed by, with a sword. But the other two wrote down their memoirs of this magnificent experience with Christ. Here's a picture. I like art. This is a Lodvico Caracay 
and this was painted in 1594. And it's a magnificent picture of the brightness of Jesus. But you know, no painting, no canvas could ever capture what really happened on that mountain. This is my favorite one though. It doesn't project too well, but Karl Block, Jesus speaking with Moses and Elijah on the mountain, they were just dumbfounded. Go to this uh, website, Karl Block's uh, uh, website. He painted these magnificent pictures of the New Testament, and they're all wonderful to see and so vibrant. You and I get the picture painted in our souls. If we open the window, the portal to heaven, and we behold this as something new and fresh and alive, something happens inside of us that we're going to change us. That's a, maybe a little better rendition. Moses and Elijah, and you can barely make Jesus out in the middle. This is Mount Tabor, where it might have happened. And this is Mount Hermon. You can barely see it. It's very, very high. I kind of doubt it happened there because it gets so cold at night <laughs> on that place. And so I wanted to tell you, let's, before we look at those points, Matthew chapter 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as the light. And there appeared before him Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter hadn't learned this, the principle of wait, W-A-I-T, why am I talking? So Peter says to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, tabernacles, one for you, one for Eliza, and one for Moses. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples had heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. They won't receive it. This is not the right time. Don't let these stories multiply, get embellished, wait until the right time to divulge the story. And that's exactly what they did. Steve read for us a moment ago in, in Mark chapter 9. Let me just re reiterate that. And he said to them, I tell you the truth, there are some who are standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, he took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up to a high mountain where they were alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying because he was terrified. Then the cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice from the midst of the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, there was no one, they saw no one except Jesus. And coming down from the mountain, he said, don't tell anyone until the son of man be risen from the dead. And in Luke chapter 9, you get the window open, you feel the breeze of the Spirit from the Word of God. In verse 28, about eight days after Jesus had said this, he took Peter, James, and John with him and went up to a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. His clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glory, glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure and about what he was going to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, and when they became fully awake, they saw the glory and the two men standing with him. And as the men were leaving Jesus, leaving Jesus, Peter said, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's capture this moment. Let's post it up on Facebook. 
oh, he didn't have Facebook, I'm sorry. Um, let us build these three tabernacles. We can stay here. He wanted to capture and save this moment. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid. As they entered the cloud, a voice from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one what they had seen. And so we see this window into the glorious splendor, this great experience of these disciples that they later wrote about that what they were so magnificently changed by. You know, it didn't make them heroes. Um, the Mount of Tr- Transfiguration didn't make any heroes because later on they still abandoned him. All of them fled. All of them left. Peter denied him rather than own or their savior, the Lord Jesus, they denied him. But later, remembering and writing down their memories, they could not help but to spend some time remembering the time that they walked up that mountain and were with Jesus, and he was transfigured before them. The Greek is very powerful. It uses three words, stilbo, lukos, and extrapo, to explain what Jesus looked like. Stilbo says he was glittering, glistening, radiant before them. Are you watching the Winter Olympics? Anybody doing them? Uh, you notice all of those uh, magnificent skaters uh, under the spotlights, they wear the sparkling sequins and they, they're glittering. I'd love to see that, don't you? But that's reflected light from the spotlight. What Jesus was glistening and glowing and, and sparkling and glittering was from within. It was not from without. He was not reflecting. He was projecting. The light was from within him. He was, in a matter of fact, the, the Shekinah of God. Someone suggested to us, and I haven't made up my mind about that, that Jesus always looked this way, but they just couldn't see it. And on that mountain, he revealed himself to them. I believe that, may, that could be true, but I, I have to tend to believe that Jesus was a fully a human being just like you and I, and he didn't have this sparkly stuff inside. <laughs> no, he was like us. Lucas, it means brilliant in whiteness. Exceedingly white and brilliant. Have you ever seen something so white that it tricked your eyes and it looked a little blue? You see that at night sometimes when the snow is on the fields and it's so brilliantly white, you you have to hide your eyes from it because it's so brilliant. And it catches the blue sky and that beautiful white field of snow has got a slight hint of blue. It's magnificent in brightness. Our Savior is brilliantly white, sparkling, glistening, radiant, and extrapo. That's flashing, like a bolt of lightning flashing. And the Greek, Matthew, Mark, and Luke use all of those um, magnificent words to describe the moment when they came out of their slumber. The light was so bright, they came out of their slumber, and there before them was Jesus, brilliant in his beauty, and power, and splendor. And he's talking with Moses. Moses was the provider of the covenant. He's talking with Elijah. He was the protector of the covenant. And here is Jesus, the perfecter of the covenant of God. And they're talking with Jesus about something that's going to happen. And Peter and John and James overheard enough of the conversation to know that they were talking about the, de- the decease of Jesus and his accomplishment, what would happen because of it. You know, that word decease is very interesting in the Greek. When it says that Moses and, and Elijah were talking with Jesus about his decease, the word in the Greek is exodus. It is actually the word exodus. And isn't it interesting that Jesus is talking, at least Moses, who led the exodus out, And so if you really think about this for a moment, Moses is talking about Jesus about the second exodus. Not about his death. He's talking about the exodus when he's going to lead the people of God out of the depths of sin into another place. Moses had one exodus. Jesus will complete the exodus and take us 
all the way home with him. Just these five points. I have struggled to, to tell you how I feel about this picture. This comes to us through the window of God's word. It's magnificent. I feel differently about this, this season of Lent and thinking about the transfiguration that I did last time, uh, last year when we talked about the same thing because to me it's so much more profound. It's so much more intriguing and it's so wonderful to think about seeing the Son of God in a magnificent way, sparkling, flashing, brilliant in splendor, talking about the day that he's going to go to the cross and lead another exodus out. When I linger at the transfiguration, I approach an open portal into heaven. Beloved, this is the window. And when you and I approach this particular scene and others, we're standing before the open portal of God. Just think that you and I today get to open this book and spend three witnesses get to look at what happened on that mountain. I looked at every detail, looked at every scripture, related scripture about this that I could for the last couple of years. And I could tell you tons of details, but you know, I got to the end of it. I said, you know, it's not about the details. It's about the Savior. I'll give you one interesting, one little detail. Peter was not uh, saying something that was so stupid after all. When he said, Let's build three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. You know why? Because it was the time of the year of the Feast of the Tabernacles. And Peter said, hey, this is perfect. It's the Feast of the Tabernacles. Let's have three right here. We can go camping with God right here. Another interesting detail is uh, both, nobody knows what happened to Moses' body. We know from the scripture that Satan wanted it. And what he wanted to do with the body of Moses, no one could guess. But God took him on home. But no one knows where the grave of Moses was or is. And of course, you know, Elijah, God sent his own personal chariot to pick him up, to take him home. He didn't, he didn't go into the ground. And so these two marvelous characters from the Old Testament, the provider of the covenant of God, the protector of the covenant of God, and now Jesus talking to them, he's going to perfect the covenant of God for them. And so we have this open window into heaven. Beloved, I am tell you that I'm on fire for this word, and I have a deeper love for this Bible than I have ever had before. I think I've told you when I became a Christian when I was 16, went down to the, the five and 10 cent store and bought my first Bible with a big old zipper on it. It was a red letter. Look at these holy words. I can't tell you the stupid ideas I had when I was a young Christian. And I stuck that, pill, that, stuck that Bible under my pillow and I slept with it like that. This word is so wonderful. And if we just would spend the time and open our souls and listen to the spirit as he reveals the son of God to us, it's an open window, it's an open portal into heaven. When I, again, linger at the transfiguration, I get, a, I get to see a preview of the second coming. Jesus, just a few days before this, had told the disciples, you know, there's some people standing right here that won't die until they see the coming of the kingdom of God with power. Six days later, three of them did. They saw a preview of coming attractions for the second coming. And Jesus, in all of his splendor, sparkling and glory, with the, with the raised saints of Moses and Elijah in the rarefied air of glory, standing at the very brink of heaven, that little veil between us and heaven, they were standing at that veil. They got a, a preview of the coming of Christ in all of his splendor and all of his glory. When I linger near the window into the transfiguration of Christ, I personally can experience the power of transformation. You cannot get into this atmosphere. You cannot go to the mountain with Jesus. You cannot be there with him without something happening to you. When you see the splendor, the sparkling, and the glory of Jesus there, it's got to do something to you. There's a power of transformation in this word. And not only here, in other places, but here especially is really captures my heart. 
I experience the power of a transformation. And it might be just uh, incremental. Every time I look at this, I feel incrementally grown and more transformed than before. And when you go to the word of God, you are sanctified bit by bit, line by line, precept upon precept. God builds and transforms your life and mine. I experience the power of transformation when I see the transformed Savior. And I'm drawn to him. And I love the moment when Moses and Elijah had, had, had gone back into glory. And they had fallen on their faces and they heard this cloud that had enveloped their whole being. The cloud of light did not leave one part of their body untouched. They breathed it in. Think about breathing in the presence of God. How magnificent is that? And they heard that voice that shattered their, their, their comfort, fell on their faces, and then all is quiet, and Jesus comes and touches them. Be not afraid. Don't tell anybody. And so they rose, and they were with Jesus better transformed than they were before. When I linger at the transfiguration of Christ, I grasp the promise of my own future glory. The Bible says this, we shall be like him. We shall, because we, we shall see him as he is. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, 21, that he will change us and give us a body like his. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, At the last trump, the trumpets shall sound and we shall be changed. And so we look at the glorified Christ, we shall be like him. I grasp the promise of my own future glory when I see this transfiguration. I hope you can look at yourself in that. When, as I said it last week, you were in Jesus on the cross. Can I get an amen? Amen. You were in Jesus at the borders of baptism. Can I get an amen? You were in Jesus at the resurrection from the tomb. You were in Jesus at the ascension of Jesus. Now, I'm going to put you on the mountain with Jesus at your transfiguration. You were in Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because you will be like him. You will see him as he is. I grasp the promise. When I linger... In the moment of transfiguration, the light of Christ becomes my motif and my pattern. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? You know, when I spend time here with Jesus, and I call out to him, and according to some TV personalities, if you hear Jesus, you're mentally ill. You heard that, right, last week? The, one of the ladies on The View, Joy Bear, she says, you know, Mike Pence talks to Jesus, that's Okay. But when Mike Pence says that Jesus talks to him, I think he's mentally ill. That's what the world thinks. But when I spend time with Jesus here in this word, I may not hear his audible whisper to my soul, but I do sometimes. But I hear the presence of the Holy Spirit speaking to me right from here. But the motif of my life has changed. What a motif is. A motif is one of the the Rembrandt, Rubens, the main artist, they had a theme that you could see in all of their painting. Architecture, there's a certain architectural style that people have, you see it ever so lightly in every bit of work that they do. Jesus becomes your motif. He becomes your pattern. And if, if you are just with him ever so briefly, Some of us don't pray so often that God will take five minutes from us if he can get it. (laughs) But if you spend some time with Christ, your life has changed. Your motif, your pattern of the way you live is changing moment by moment because of who he is and how we've come to the open window. Not a painted picture of Christ like we saw like a few moments ago, but the living Christ in the open portal to heaven and we look for him there. Can you say amen? Amen. Pray with me.